Tennessee. My name is Pastor Bill Schultz, and uh, it is great to have you watching today, and this is a fantastic Shabbos. A little cold outside, but it is a perfectly clear blue sky. We are celebrating God's Sabbath today, and we're going to have a great time. Now, today I'm going to give a, a message, a survey of the Passover. I'm not sure how many of the Passover matches, messages I will be able to get up on, online here, but we're going to put these in an album. We're redoing the Holy Day album. We're going to bring a lot of new things that the Lord has revealed to us over the years we've been at Hungry Hearts, and we're going to put together a more concept, comprehensive teaching on the Holy Days. <clears throat> now, to start the survey on the Passover, we're going to start with Joseph. The Israelites did not end up in Egypt by accident. It was all a part of the plan of God. It was kind of presaged by Abraham going into Egypt for a time and coming out. And so we're going to start with Moses. Joseph, I mean, sorry, we're going to start with Joseph. <laughs> Joseph was sent to Egypt. So we're going to start in Genesis 41. And we're going to read a little bit about Joseph. So Joseph had dreams, and um, he got his brothers angry at him, and they sold him in to slavery. Hey, welcome, everybody. Come on in. They sold him into slavery, and then Pharaoh had dreams, and Joseph was called to interpret those dreams. So I think we're all pretty well familiar with that passage where the Pharaoh sees the fat seven fat cows and the seven lean cows Joseph gives Pharaoh the interpretation of God and then Pharaoh we're going to cut in here in verse 41 of Genesis 41 so Pharaoh said to Joseph I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt so Joseph now is made prime minister or vizier he is the ruler over Egypt <clears throat> and then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his finger and put it on Joseph's finger now, that doesn't mean much to us because today we just sign our name in cursive, and that is our signature, and that is how we do it. But in this time, they didn't do that. They didn't sign their name in cursive. They had a ring, and this ring would be pushed into a clay seal on a document, and that would verify and certify that this document was from the person. So when Pharaoh takes off his signet ring and gives it to Joseph, he now has all the power and authority of Pharaoh because when he takes the Pharaoh's signet ring and puts it in the clay seal on a document, that is the power of Pharaoh throughout Egypt. He dressed him in robes of fine linen, put a gold chain around his neck. He made him ride in a chariot as his second in command, and men shouted before him, Make way! So Joseph's being carried in a chariot. He's obviously not driving. And there will be men running in front of the chariot. Make way. Make way. Clear the way. Joseph is coming through. And he had him ride in a chariot. And thus he put him in charge of the whole land of Egypt. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, but without your word, no one's going to lift hand or foot in all of Egypt. So Pharaoh gave Joseph the name Zaphonath Paneah, and gave him Asenath, daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On, to be his wife. And Joseph went throughout the land of Egypt. No one could do anything unless Joseph said it was okay. Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh. And Joseph went out from Pharaoh's presence and traveled throughout Egypt. During the seven years of abundance, the land produced plentifully. Now, in his book, The Exodus Case... Dr. Leonard Moeller shows a place in Saqqara where there's a giant stone, um, I'll call it cavern for lack of a better word, and it, they can't even measure it. They've tried to use laser, laser measurements, engineers have, to say how much grain it would hold. But when God says the amount of grain was immeasurable, we still haven't figured out how much that is. That's a that's pretty, that's pretty large hole in the ground in Saqqara. Joseph collected all the food produced in those seven years of abundance and stored it in the cities. In each city, he put the grow, food grown in the fields surrounding it. Joseph stored huge quantities of grain like the sand of the sea. It was so much that he stopped keeping records because it was beyond measure. This is, this is a pretty big deal. This is how the whole exodus starts. It starts with Joseph going to Egypt and being put in charge of the land 
and producing many great and, and wondrous things for the Egyptians. Why? Because God's hand was with him. Before the years of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph by Asenath, daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On. So he's down there. He starts to build a family down there. He's over Egypt. Everybody is happy. Now, in the Exodus case, Dr. Moeller has a theory that Joseph was the famed Egyptian Imhotep. Imhotep is regarded in Egypt as the father of their, their architecture, the father of their governmental systems, the father of medicine. He also asserts that the Israelites built the pyramids. Not sure, but that's his theory, and he shows various things for it. Great book if you can get it, the Exodus case. I just do want to point out that the work in here is a verification of the work of archaeologist Ron Wyatt. That's an important thing to note. Now, down in chapter 50, after Israel dies, there is a couple of passages here that show just how important Joseph was. In chapter 50, verse 7, Joseph went up to bury his father. All of Pharaoh's officials accompanied him, the dignitaries of his court, and all the dignitaries of Egypt. So Joseph is held in such high regard by the Egyptians that they all go up with him to bury his father. It's a big deal. Besides all the members of Joseph's household and his brothers and those belonging to his father's household, only their children, their flocks, and their herds were left in Goshen. Chariots and horsemen also went up with them. A very large company. Well, he's prime minister to Pharaoh. Of course, he's going to have military protection. So he goes up. This great multitude goes up to honor Israel after his death. Now, when they reached the fleshing threshing floor of Atad near Jordan, they lamented loudly and bitterly. And there Joseph observed a seven-day period of mourning for his father. So they get to the, the Jordan River and they stop and they conduct a service for seven days before they take Israel up to the cave of Machpelah where Abraham and Isaac are buried. When the Canaanites who lived there saw the mourning at the threshing floor of Atad, they said the Egyptians are holding a solemn assembly of mourning. That is why the place near the Jordan is called Abel Mizram, Mizraim. So here there's such a big deal that even the Canaanites are like, whoa, this guy's really important to the Egyptians. Now the Canaanites were city-states. And they made alliances with the Akkadians and the Hittites and the Egyptians, one against each other, jockeying for position. So at times, Egypt controlled this land. At times, the Hittite Empire controlled parts of this land. At times, the Akkadians would come down and control this land. So this is a big deal when you get into their politics. Now, down at 20, verse 24... When Joseph is about to die, he said to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will surely come to your aid and take you up out of this land to the land he promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So Joseph made the sons of Israel swear an oath. Don't leave my bones here. When you guys leave, don't leave my bones here. Surely God will come to your aid and then you must carry my bones up from this place. So Joseph died at the age of 110. That's important to the, Israel, the Egyptians, but not to us. To the Egyptians, the age of 110 was a perfect life. So God did this for Joseph to give him acclaim and esteem and favor with the Egyptians. Why? Because Moses is going to need this later when he takes them out, as you'll see. After that, they embalmed him. You know, he had his father embalmed also. And he placed, was, placed him in a coffin in Egypt. Now, I don't have a, a copy here, but in the video, Patterns of Evidence, David Roll and another archaeologist from uh, Austria named Betak Manfred has found where Joseph was buried in Egypt. An interesting thing. The tomb was broken into, and there were no grave goods. Well, that's, that's normal, right? They break into a tomb and everybody steals the grave goods. But what's unusual about this tomb is there's no bones. Usually the grave robbers could care less about the body. They take, they take the money. 
They leave the body, has no value to them. But it's showing you it's Joseph's tomb because his brothers took his bones. I'm not going to turn to that passage, but that's in the Exodus. They took the bones of Moses with them. I mean, Joseph with them. All right. So this is a prophecy about the return to Canaan. They're going to go back to Canaan. The, the, the time in Egypt was a sojourn. It wasn't where they were going to be. Now we get to Moses. Moses was heir apparent to Pharaoh. That's important. Because Moses was the crown prince. He would have been the next Pharaoh of Egypt. He was crown prince. And when you start the Exodus story, it says a new Pharaoh rose up who did not remember Joseph. It's all a fairy tale. None of that stuff happened back there. You know, people say that now about, about American history, right? Oh, it's all a fairy tale. None of that stuff happened back there. So people do that after time goes on. So in Exodus 2, in verse 10, we read about Moses. <clears throat> so Moses, you know, was born, and the Pharaoh's trying to kill all the males of, of Israel. And he puts, they put the boy in the water, and Moses' sister Miriam is trailing the ark along the bank hiding in the bushes, going along, watching where that little ark goes to see what happened to Moses. So Pharaoh's daughter draws this baby out, and they hire Moses' mother to nurse the child. So when, in verse 10, when the child grew older, she took him, to Pharaoh, took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. So he's Pharaoh's daughter. And this is how the Egyptians did the royal line. It had to be the son of Pharaoh's daughter. So this is how they kept the sons and the daughters together. Ended up destroying their line, but that's how they did it. So I'm going to read you a little bit from Josephus, who also gives some additional history about this. So on page 54, uh, we're going to read a little bit about what Josephus has to say about Moses. It's kind of important. Setting up the story for the Passover. 54. All right, paragraph number seven. However, talking about the famine, the famine increased among the Egyptians, and this is and this heavy judgment grew more oppressive to them because neither did the river overflow the ground for it did not rise to its former height. Now there's only one archaeologist in the world that picks this up from Josephus and finds that period. Everybody else thinks that it's a drought, but what happened was the, the, the river flooded. Nor did God send rain upon it, nor did they indeed make the least provision for themselves. So ignorant were they to be done. But Joseph sold them this is one about Joseph. I need the one about Moses. All right. Moses, Josephus records that Moses as a little boy disregarded all the things of Egypt. And so Paul records this as Jannies and Jambres opposed Moses because they saw in him the destroyer that had been prophesied. So Josephus here is saying that the daughter of Pharaoh was Thermuthus, therefore perceiving him to be so remarkable a child, adopted her for her son, having no child of her own. And, and when one time she had carried Moses to her father, she showed Moses to her father and she thought to make him her father's successor, if it should please God, she should have no legitimate child of her own. And said to him, I have brought up a child who is of divine form and of a generous mind, and I have received him from the bounty of the river in a wonderful manner. I thought proper to adopt him for my son and the heir of my, thy kingdom. And when she had said this, she put the infant in her father's hand. So Pharaoh took him and hugged him close to his breath, and on his daughter's account, in a pleasant way, put his diadem upon his head. You know, the royal symbol of authority from the Pharaoh to Moses. But Moses threw it to the ground, and in a puerile mood, he wreathed it around and trod upon it with his feet, and which seemed to bring along with it an evil presage concerning the kingdom of Egypt. But when the sacred scribes saw this, he was the same person who foretold that his nativity would bring the 
dominion of, the, of that kingdom low. He made a violent attempt to kill him, and crying out in a frightful manner, he said, This, O king, this child is he of whom God foretold, that if we kill him, we shall be in no danger. He himself affords an attestation to the prediction of the same thing by his trampling upon the government and treading upon your diadem. Take him, therefore, out of the way and deliver the Egyptians from the fear they are in about him and deprive the Hebrews of the hope they have of being encouraged by him. But Thermusus prevented him and snatched the child away, and the king was not hasty to slay him. God himself, whose providence protected Moses, inclining the king to spare him. He was therefore educated with great care. So the Hebrews depended on him or of good hopes that great things would be done by Moses. But the Egyptians were suspicious of what would follow such, such his education. Yet because if Moses had been slain, there was no other, either a kin or adopted, that had any oracle on his side for pretending to the crown of Egypt and likely to be of greater advantage to them, they abstained from killing Moses. So even in their own pagan priest, they had seen that Moses was going to be the, the bringer of their downfall and that the Hebrews were going to find success. That's in Josephus page uh, 55 number 7 now in the exodus case here on page 114 I'm just going to take a few excerpts because it's a pretty long passage I, I pulled here the Egyptian name of this lady is Neferi and uh, Moses name in Egyptian here is Senmut the child is wearing a royal ornament on his head, indicating royalty. In this context, a future heir to the throne. An heir to the throne was always a man. The, hence, these statues represent a little boy. So they have a picture here of the two of them, Neferi and Senmut. So that is an Egyptian statue of Moses and his mother, according to Dr. Moeller. And so these go on for a long time. The temple at Deir El, I can't read that small writing. Bahuri was built by Senmut for Hapshepsut. So later their, their titles change, and I'm not sure why the Egyptians changed their names. But Moses was Tutmosis. And at that time period, every heir apparent was a Tutmosis and ruled as a co regent with the Pharaoh, who would be the Amen. Moses. And so that's how they changed their names. Hatshepsut ruled in place. Remember, Moses fled Egypt. So rather than Moses moving into place as the crown prince and becoming Pharaoh, his mother rules when her father dies. And they deface her legacy after that. And he goes through he goes through lots of comparisons here between the Bible and the Egyptian writings to show that Moses is, in fact, uh, who we're claiming. And on page 120, he, he's under an article, Who was Tutmosis the, the Second? When Moses is finally appointed co-ruler at the age of 33 years, he becomes Tutmosis the Second. What happens later when Moses is 40 and dealt with in chapter 11, also chapter 17 also? Near to Thebes, there's a beautiful building called Deir al Bari, which according to this hypothesis was the temple Moses built for his stepmother Nefuri. Above this building there is a grave, grave number 71, with a statue that was never completely finished. This statue is carved out of the rock and depicts a woman holding a child. With this, the hypothesis presented in this chapter is logical that this represents Moses in the arms of his stepmother, Nefuri. This building was probably begun when Moses was 18 years old. It was probably then that he was appointed heir to the throne of, with Nefuri as regent. The names found on this grave are Nefuri and Senmut. Immediately under this grave, a chamber has been found in which there are two mummies with the names of Hatton Ophir and Ra. Ramos, most likely the Egyptian names for Moses' biological parents. Here we can see that Moses was given a godlike position in Egyptian society by giving his biological the father the name of Ramos, since Ra was the greatest god among the Egyptians. And the Deir al Bari is the mortuary temple of Hatshepsut.
Funny how that all links together in secular history. Moses would have been Pharaoh. He would have ruled the only superpower of that time. See, it's hard for us to understand that. But in the time of Moses, Egypt was the only superpower. The Hittites would occasionally get strong. They never ruled everything the way Egypt did. You know, and the the thing is, when you get to Moses, Egypt is very old. Egypt is not a young nation in the time of Moses. Let's go to Hebrews. Because the writer of Hebrews has something to say in chapter 11 about Moses, which underscores what we've been telling you. Hebrews 11, Moses starts in verse 24. We're going to read 24 to 28. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. When he grew up, he didn't want to be heir apparent, he didn't want to rule Egypt, he wanted to free the Hebrews. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. You've got to remember that as co-regent, as heir apparent, as crown prince of Egypt, there was more gold at his disposal than any of us can imagine. There were more servants. He could do whatever he wanted to. If he killed somebody, it was no big deal. He chose to be mistreated with the people of God. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking forward to his reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who was invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood so the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. That is powerful. Now let's go back to Moses' calling in Exodus chapter 3. So we talked about the importance of Israel in Egypt under Joseph. And I'm, I'm pro- oh, no, I might read them all. Exodus 3. I'm going to read about Moses' calling. So Moses flees to Midian. He killed the Egyptian. He knew it would get out. Pharaoh would be mad because Moses wasn't playing by the rules anymore. <clears throat> so picking it up in verse 1. Now Moses, in chapter 3, Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush doesn't burn up. So God used that to get his attention. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, he called to him from the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. He said, don't come any closer. God said, take off your sandals for the place you're standing is holy ground. Then he said, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of all the ites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I've seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out. Remember how he kicked the diadem on the floor and walked on it. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you've brought the people out of Egypt, you'll worship me on this mountain right here. God, Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask, What is my name? Then what do I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And this is what you are say to the Israelites. The I am has sent me to you. So God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name by which I am to be remembered from generation to generation. So Moses is now God's agent to redeem Israel from the curse of slavery. Now, the new Pharaoh doesn't regard Joseph. So Imhotep to him is just a a, a legend. It's a fantasy. It's a fairy tale. It's not really real. So in Exodus 5 and verse 1, he is not going to listen to Moses. They know Moses is a Hebrew. They've known it the whole time. Remember, Jannies and Jambres opposed Moses because they knew he was a Hebrew. 
a usurper to the throne in their view. Verse 1, afterward Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, Let my people go, so they may hold a festival to me in the desert. Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey him? I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. Well, this is all, he knows all of this stuff. He just thinks his gods are more powerful, and he is, um, he's mocking the God of Israel. Then he said, the God of the Hebrew, then they said, the God of the Hebrews has met us. Now let us take a three-day journey into the desert to offer the sacrifices to the Lord our God, or he may strike us with plague or the sword. But the king of Egypt said, Moses and Aaron, why are you taking the people away from their labor? Get back to your work. So now he's trying to even put Moses and Aaron in servitude. Then Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are now numerous, and you're stopping them from working. That same day, Pharaoh gave this order to the slave drivers and foremen in charge of the people. You're no longer to supply the people with straw for making bricks. Let them go and gather their own straw, but require them to make the same number of bricks as before. Do not reduce their quota. They are lazy, and that's why they're crying out. Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Make the work harder for the men so they keep working and pay no attention to lies. So he's going to make life harder for the Israelites, but God is not impressed. We're going to go over to verse chapter 7. And I'm going to kind of briefly summarize the plagues. <clears throat> like I said, this is a survey. We'll get into all this deeper in subsequent weeks. <clears throat> Exodus 7 and verse 8. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, When Pharaoh says you perform a miracle, then you say to Aaron, Take your staff and throw it down before Pharaoh, and it will become a snake, a nakash. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded, and Aaron threw his staff down in front of Pharaoh and its officials, and it became a snake. Moses then summoned the wise men and sorcerers and the Egyptian magicians also did the same thing with their secret arts. They each one threw down his staff and it became a snake. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Yet Pharaoh's heart became hard and he would not listen to them just as the Lord said. So they have the little snake thing. Aaron's snake wins and they, they're not impressed. Verse 20. <clears throat> Moses and Aaron, Aaron did just as the Lord had commanded. He raised his staff in the presence of Pharaoh and his officials and struck the water of the Nile, and all the water is changed to blood. The fish in the Nile died. The river smelled so bad the Egyptians could not drink its water. Blood was everywhere in Egypt. But look at verse 22. The Egyptian magicians did the same thing by their secret arts, and Pharaoh's heart became hard, and he would not listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord had said. And in chapter 8, verse 5. <clears throat> I'm going to repeat this several times. The Lord said to Moshe, Tell Aaron, stretch out your hand with your staff over the streams and canals and ponds and make frogs come up on the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his staff over the waters of Egypt and the frogs came up and covered the land. But the magicians did the same thing by their secret arts and they also made frogs come upon the land of Egypt. So they're not impressed. Verse 16, The Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the ground, and throughout the land of Egypt the dust will become gnats. They did this, and when Aaron stretched out his hand with the staff and struck the dust, gnats came upon men and animals, and all the dust throughout the land of Egypt became gnats. But when the magicians tried to do this, it didn't work. They couldn't do it. Pharaoh's not impressed. He's not going to hear. Verse 24. <clears throat> And the Lord did this. Dense swarm of flies poured into Pharaoh's house, palace, and all the houses of his officials. And throughout Egypt, the land was ruined by flies. Pharaoh's not impressed. He's not going to let them go. Sometimes he says yes, but then he never does it. Changes his mind. Chapter 9 and verse 5. <clears throat> The Lord said a time and said, Tomorrow the Lord will do this in the land. And the next day the Lord did it. All the livestock of the Egyptians died, but not one animal belonging to the Israelites died. Pharaoh sent men to investigate and found that not even one of the animals of the Israelites died. Yet his heart was unyielding, and he would not let the people go. Verse 10. So they took soot from, a, soot from a furnace and threw it, stood before Pharaoh, and Moses tossed it in the air, and boils broke out over everybody the magicians couldn't even stand before Moses because of the boils and all of the Egyptians but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart he would not listen not impressed not going to have it 
Not hearing it. Chat, verse 22. The Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward the sky so that hail will fall all over Egypt on men and animals and on everything growing in the fields. When Moses stretched out his staff toward the sky, the Lord sent thunder, thunder and hail and lightning flashed to the ground, and the Lord rained hail on all the land of Egypt. Hail fell and lightning flashed back and forth. It was the worst storm in the land of Egypt since it had become a nation. And it struck everything and destroyed everything in the fields, both men and animals. Stripped every tree. They're not impressed. This is craziness. Chapter 10 and verse 12. And the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over Egypt so that locusts will swarm over the land and devour everything growing in the fields and everything left by the hail. <clears throat> so Moses stretched out his staff over Egypt, and the Lord made an east wind blow across the land all day and all that night. By morning the wind had brought locusts, and they covered the ground in great numbers. Never before had there been such a plague of locusts, nor there will ever be again. It covered the ground until everything was dark, and they devoured everything left by the hail. Nothing green remained in the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh's not impressed. He says, I'll let you go, but then he changes his mind. No, I'm not letting you go. Verse 21. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward the sky, so that darkness will spread over Egypt. Darkness that can be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward the sky, and total darkness covered all of Egypt. No one could see anyone else or leave his place for three days. Yet the Israelites had light in their places. Summon Moses, pray for me, and he changes his mind. And he's not impressed. Chapter 11 and verse 4. <clears throat> so Moses said, This is what the Lord says about midnight. I will go throughout Egypt. Every firstborn son in Egypt will die. From the firstborn son of Pharaoh who sits on the throne to the firstborn son of the slave girl who's at her hand mill. And all the firstborn of the cattle as well. And there will be loud wailing throughout Egypt. Worse than it's ever been or ever will be again. But among the Israelites, not even a dog will bark. Then you'll know that the Lord makes a distinction between the Israelites and Egypt. And all these officials of yours will come to, come to me, bowing down before me and saying, Go, you and all the people who follow you. And after that, I'll leave. Then Moses, hot with anger, left Pharaoh. So we know how that worked out for him. Not very well. But this is what brings us to the Passover. And you had to understand how they got there, why they got there, why God did it, what he did, and what he did to bring them out. So essentially... The Lord God of Israel executed judgment on the pagan gods of the Egyptians. Well, they're idols. They're not gods. But there's demons behind those idols that make things happen for them. And God executed judgment on all of that fallen angelic world that was animating the Egyptian society. So now in verse 12, the Lord is going to talk to Moses and Aaron about Passover. Now, the secular calendar of the Hebrews starts at the first of Tishri and runs to the next Tishri. That is the secular year. It's supposedly, and I kind of believe it, based on the creation of Adam on Tishri 1. But God is going to step in and say, this month for you is the first month. So there is a secular calendar on which your business is based, and there is a religious calendar on how to figure the holy days. Interesting. Interesting. Because interesting things happen on that. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of the month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they are to share one with their nearest neighbor, taking into account the number of people there are. The whole idea was that you ate the lamb, not that you had leftover. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be year old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month when all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. They are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. And that same night they are to eat the meat roasted over fire along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or cooked in water, but roast it over the fire, head, legs, and inner parts. Do not leave any of it until morning, and if some is left till morning, you must burn it up. But the idea is to make sure you have enough people to eat the lamb. Now an interesting side note, in one of the Psalms it says, They left Egypt, not one sick among them. And it's found out now that when you eat certain of the organ meats from a lamb, there's healing in your body. So that's not here in Exodus. 
But that's what modern science has found out, that when you eat certain of the organ meats of this lamb, I can't bring myself to eat eyeballs. I just can't do it. I'm sorry, guys. I just can't do it. I know I need it, but I just can't make myself do it. <clears throat> this is how you're to eat it. With your cloak tucked in your belt, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand, eat it in pace. In haste, it is the Lord's Passover. On the same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both men and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. Now, at this point, verse 14 shifts into the first day of unleavened bread. I'm bringing these things up because I want you to understand the basics of Passover, and I want, I'm trying to convey to you the timing of the Passover. Big controversy in modern America over this, but I'm going to show you from the Scriptures why it's the way it is. Now, he picks up with Passover again in verse 31. During the night... Sorry, verse 29, at midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn of Egypt. At midnight. Midnight on the 14th. Now, people are a big argument going on right now on Facebook about whether the days start at night or whether they start in the morning. But the whole first chapter of Genesis is evening and morning is one day. The whole first chapter says that. Evening and morning, one day. Evening and morning, one day. God is resetting this, and he's telling us a story in that, but that's the way he set it up. So if the 14th starts at sundown and the death angel comes at midnight, that's not the end of the 14th. If you don't sacrifice your lamb at the beginning of the 14th, you're not here on the, at the end of the 14th to talk about it because the death angel's rolling through at midnight. Midnight's still midnight. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on the throne to the firstborn of the prisoner who was in the dungeon and the firstborn of all the livestock as well, Pharaoh and all his officials and all the Egyptians got up during the night and there was loud wailing in Egypt <clears throat> for there was not a house with someone dead. And during the night Pharaoh summoned Moses. So it's not even daylight yet. We're not even to the daylight portion of the 14th of Nisan. Get up. Get out. Go worship the Lord as you have requested. Take your flocks and your herds and go. And the Egyptians urged the people to hurry and leave the country. Lee, get out of here. Otherwise, we're all dead men. So the people took their dough before the yeast was added and carried it on their shoulders in kneading troughs wrapped in clothing. The Israelites did as Moses instructed and asked the Egyptians for articles of silver and gold and for clothing. The Lord had made the Egyptians favorably disposed toward the people, and they gave them what they asked for. So they plundered the Egyptians. I don't know how we missed this all those years, but somehow we let that get by. The Israelites journeyed from Ramesses to Sukkot, and there were about 600,000 men on foot besides women and children. So that's at the beginning of the 15th. Now, I'm going to show you this for real. Let's go to Numbers chapter 33. And Moses is giving the catalog of their departure. And he makes an interesting statement that forever ends the controversy. Numbers 33, verse 3. The Israelites set out from Ramesses on the 15th day of the first month, the day after the Passover. So they kept Passover on the 14th because they left on the 15th. They marched out boldly in full view of all the Egyptians who were burying their firstborn, whom the Lord had struck down. So that kind of ends that controversy. The whole idea is that we want the death angel to pass over our house. Amen? Now, we're going to look at a couple of historical examples. We'll start in Joshua 5. Uh, you know, the 40 years in the, in the wilderness, they were rebellious, right? They didn't do what God said. He said, I'm going I'm to cut off everybody. And he did. So with Joshua in chapter 5, we're starting over again. And we're just starting over again. I think we call it a do-over now. But they need a do-over because for 40 years in the wilderness, they refused to obey. That's what got Moses mad and got him not allowed to go into the promised land. He got mad at them because they just wouldn't obey. So Joshua chapter 5 and verse 1. Now when the 
All the Amorite kings west of the Jordan and all of the Canaanite kings along the coast heard how the Lord had dried up the Jordan before the Israelites until we had crossed over. Their hearts melted. They had no longer had the courage to face the Israelites. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, Make flint knives and circumcise the Israelites again. So they had to be circumcised before they left Egypt. And since they were so rebellious in the wilderness, they didn't circumcise their sons on the eighth day like they were instructed. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the Israelites at Gibeath Ha'aralo. <clears throat> now this is why he did so. All those who came out of Egypt, all the men of military age, died in the desert on the way after leaving Egypt. And all the people that came out had been circumcised, but all the people born in the desert during the journey had not. Why? Because their parents weren't obedient. They knew. They were told what to do. You're supposed to circumcise your boy on the eighth day. Since they had not obeyed the Lord, for the Lord had sworn to them that they would not see the land that he had solemnly promised to their fathers to give us, a land flowing with milk and honey. So he raised up their sons in their place, and these were the ones Joshua circumcised. They were still uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. And after the whole nation had been circumcised, they remained where they were in the camp until they were healed. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Today I've rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. See, before they could go take possession of the Holy Land, he had to consecrate the people and make them holy. On the evening of the 14th day of the month, while camped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, the Israelites celebrated the Passover. See, when they started being disobedient, they quit keeping the Passover. They quit observing everything. It was just one contention after another. And then when he brings them to, it's starting over. So the day after they passed over, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land. So they celebrated the Passover with manna. And the day after the Passover, on the first day of unleavened bread, they ate produce of the land, unleavened bread and roasted grain. And the manna stopped the day after they ate this food. So the second day of unleavened bread, no more manna. You're eating, you're eating from Canaan. <clears throat> there was no longer any manna from the Israelites, but that year they ate the produce of Canaan. They rolled away the reproach. They were starting over. Everybody had to go through the process of getting right with God. This ties directly into writing that sin list because we've got to circumcise our hearts every year before the Passover. Amen. Mm -hmm. Now, let's go to Hezekiah in 2 Chronicles 30. Hezekiah comes to rule after a long period of wicked kings. And Israel, the northern tribes, are gone. They've been carried to Assyria to captivity, yet a few were brought back. If you remember the story... The Assyrian king settled the land with people from where northern Iran meets the, all the stands and southern was the bottom part of the Soviet Union. And lions came in among them. So the pagan Assyrians said, we're not appeasing the gods of the land because that's how they viewed things. So they chose some priests from the northern tribe and they sent back some Israelites from the northern tribes to go back to the land. This is how you get the Samaritans. Because it was a mongrel people. Some Israelites mixed with the people from north of Iran that were resettled there. And they become the Samaritans. <clears throat> That's why the Jews of Jesus, they didn't want anything to do with them. Because they weren't all right. <clears throat> so Hezekiah now. In chapter 30, verse 1, Hezekiah sent word to all Israel and Judah and also wrote letters to Ephraim and Manasseh. Now, these aren't the whole tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh. These are the, the, the few that the king of Assyria sent back so the lions wouldn't eat the people they moved there. <clears throat> to come to the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem and celebrate the Passover to the Lord, the God of Israel. Now, this hadn't been going on in a long time. If you go back to the previous chapter, you find out that Hezekiah had to clean all the pollution and the filth out of the temple because they had been, they had been worshiping Baal there and defiled the temple of God. So if, if you go back and you read the, the, the prior chapters here, they're having to cleanse everything, and they couldn't get it in time for Passover. <clears throat> well, watch this. The, Lord, the king and his officials and the whole assembly of Jerusalem decided to celebrate the Passover in the second month. See, they couldn't get it consecrated until the middle of what should have been the Days of Unleavened Bread. So they decided, since we can't get everything ready on time, we're going to do Passover in the second month. Well, uncleanness is a reason for that, by the way. And now he's going to invite everybody of Israelite descent to come to, to Jerusalem to keep the Passover. 
they at verse 3 they had not been able to celebrate at the regular time because not enough priests had consecrated themselves and the people had not assembled well there's more to it and you can read that in chapter 29 later the plan seemed right to both the king and the whole assembly and they decided to send a proclamation throughout Israel from Beersheba to Dan calling the people to come to Jerusalem and celebrate the Passover to the Lord the God of Israel it had not been celebrated in large numbers according to what was written so again Hezekiah is trying to make a recovery. And we're going to read part of his letter here, uh, starting in, in verse 13, where he is talking about what to do to try to get this restarted. I'm sorry, you can read his letter later. It starts up here in verse 6. And he is telling them that you, you and the northern tribes were hauled off captive to Assyria. And if the remnant of you that the king of Assyria brought back will come and keep the Passover, maybe, maybe we can get God's favor to bring all of the country back together again. Right? So in verse 13, a very large crowd of people assembled in Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread in the second month. They removed the altars in Jerusalem and cleared away the incense altars and threw them into the Kidron Valley. They slaughtered the Passover lamb on the 14th day of the second month, and the priests and the Levites were ashamed and consecrated themselves and brought burnt offerings to the temple of the Lord. And they took up their regular positions as prescribed in the law of Moses, the man of God. And the priests sprinkled the blood handed to them by the Levites. Since many in the crowd had not consecrated themselves, the Levites had to kill the Passover lambs for all those who were not clean and could not consecrate their lambs to the Lord. Although most of the many people who came from Ephraim, Manasseh, Issachar, and Zebulon had not purified themselves, yet they ate the Passover contrary to what was written. But Hezekiah prayed for them, saying, May the Lord who is good pardon everybody who sets his heart on seeking God, the Lord, the God of his fathers, even if he is not clean according to the rules of the sanctuary. And the Lord heard Hezekiah and healed the people. You see, Joshua got favor because he was resetting everything before they went into Passover. I mean, the promised land. Now Hezekiah, after a long period of infidelity, is trying to bring the people back to God, and God hears the prayers because he wants the recovery. Verse 26. <clears throat> there was great joy in Jerusalem, for since the days of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, there had been nothing like this in Jerusalem. See how far back it goes? Every recovery goes back to a, a long time, right? The, the next, the last one we're going to do is going to go back even further than that. <clears throat> the priests and the Levites stood to bless the people, and God heard them for their prayer. Prayer reached heaven, his holy dwelling place. So when you're, you're a religious person, and you're trying to restore what's been lost for decades of sin and, and idolatry, the Lord rushes in to see that it catches and takes hold. Now, Josh, let's go to Josiah, 2 Chronicles 34, a couple of chapters over. What's interesting about Josiah, and we'll eventually get to this, the people were preparing to fly. Josiah's Passover. They were about to be carried off to Babylon. And I believe, just my opinion, but I believe that this Passover here is consecrating those. If you remember, the Jews were pulled out of Judah in two waves. Nebuchadnezzar came one time and pulled out the best of the best. Nebuchadnezzar came a second time under Zedekiah and pulled out whoever was left. And I think that all the people who were going to be movers and shakers in Babylon to restore Judaism to the people and bring them back to God were consecrated this Passover. Just my opinion, but I think that's how it went. In verse 14... They find the book of the law. They go to hold of the prophet. And God says, I have, I have heard your prayer, and I'm going to answer it. When they were bringing out all the money that had been taken to, into the temple of the Lord, verse 14, Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord that had been given through Moses. And Hilkiah said to Shaphan the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the temple of the Lord. And he gave it to Shaphan. Then Shaphan took the book to the king and reported to him, Your officials are doing everything that has been committed to them. They have paid out the money that was in the temple of the Lord and have entrusted it to the supervisors and workers. Then Shaphan, the secretary, informed the king, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read from it in the presence of the king. 
Now when the king heard the words of the law, he tore his robes, and he gave these orders to Hilkiah, Ahikam, son of Shaphan, Abdon, son of Micah, Shaphan, the secretary, and Asaiah, the king's attendant. Go inquire of the Lord for me, for the remnant of Israel and Judah, that is what about what is written in this book that has been found. Great is the Lord's anger that is poured out on us because he, our forefathers have not kept the word of the Lord and they have not acted in accordance with all that is written in this book. Then Hilkiah, I'm sorry, verse 23, they go to Hilda, a prophetess, and she said to them, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, tell the man that sent you to me, this is what the Lord says. I am going to bring disaster on this place and its people. All the curses written in the book that has been read in the presence of the king of Judah. Because they have forsaken me and burned incense to other gods and provoked me to anger by all that their hands have made. My anger will be poured out in this place and will not be quenched. Tell the king of Judah who sent you to inquire of the Lord. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says concerning the words you heard. Because your heart was responsive. And you humbled yourself before God when you heard what he spoke against this place and its people. And because you humbled uh, him, yourself before me and tore your robes and wept in my presence, I have heard you, declares the Lord. Now I will gather you to your fathers and you will be buried in peace. Your eyes will not see the disaster that I'm going to bring on this place. Now the Passover starts in verse chapter uh, 35, verse 1. Josiah separated the Passover to the Lord in Jerusalem, and the Passover lamb was slaughtered on the 14th day of the first month. He appointed priests to their duties and encouraged them in the service of the Lord's temple, and he said to the Levites who instructed all Israel and who had been consecrated to the Lord, put the sacred ark in the temple that Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, built. It is not to be carried on your shoulders. So evidently they were carrying it around. They were playing with it. Not a toy. <clears throat> Remember, they did that in the time of the judges, and they lost it to the Philippine, Philistines, right? <clears throat> Prepare yourselves by families and your divisions according to the directions written by David, king of Israel, and by his son Solomon. So David, if you go back and, and you read the end of his writings, you find out that he set up all the priests and priests and courses. That's how you date the birth of Jesus. Because John the Baptist's father was a priest in a course. And you go look those courses up and you can tell what month that John the Baptist was conceived. That's how you date the birth of Jesus. <clears throat> Stand in the holy place with a group of Levites for each subdivision of the families of the priest and, and lay people. Slatter the, slaughter the Passover lambs. Consecrate yourselves and prepare the lambs for your countrymen, doing what the Lord commanded through Moses. Josiah prepared provided for all the lay people who were there a total of 30,000 sheep and goats for the Passover offerings and 3,000 cattle all from the king's own possessions. His officials also contributed voluntarily to the people and the priests and the Levites, Hilkiah, Zechariah, Jehael, the administrators of God's temple gave the priests 2,600 Passover offerings and 300 cattle. And also Conaniah along with, she I can't read all these names. <clears throat> provided 5,000 Passover offerings and 500 head of cattle for the Levites. The service was arranged and the priests stood in their places with the Levites in their divisions as the king had ordered. The Passover lambs were slaughtered and the priests sprinkled the blood handed to them while the Levites skinned the animals. They set aside the burnt offerings to give them to the subdivisions of the families of the people to offer to the Lord as is written in the book of Moses. They did the same with the cattle. They roasted the Passover animals over the fire as prescribed and boiled the holy offerings in pots, cauldrons, and pans and served them quickly to all the people. After this they made preparations for themselves and for the priest because the priest, the descendant of Aaron, were sacrificing the burnt offerings and fat portions until nightfall. So the whole day. So the Levites made preparations for themselves and for the Aaronic priests and musicians, the descendants of Asaph, were in the places described, prescribed by David, Asaph, Heman, and Jeduthun, the king's seer. The gatekeepers at each gate did not leave their post because their fellow e Levites made the preparations for them. So at that time, the entire service of the Lord was carried out for the celebration of the Passover, the offering of burnt offerings on the altar of the Lord, as King Josiah had ordered. The Israelites who were present, celebrated the Passover at that time and observed the Feast of Unleavened Bread for seven days. The Passover had not been observed like this in Israel since the days of the prophet Samuel. See, each, 
each time they come back and set their hearts, they do it in a bigger manner that goes way back in time to be matched. <clears throat> this Passover was celebrated in the 18th year of Josiah's reign. So these are three important Passovers where the people came together and obeyed the Lord the way they were told. And they had fantastic miracles that followed that. Now when we get down to Yeshua, he transforms the Passover from national deliverance from oppression into personal deliverance from sin and inducts us into the marriage covenant with him. So we're not leaving a foreign country. We're not trying to start a great revival on the mall in Washington. We're going to him for deliverance from our sin. And this same Passover meal is our induction into the marriage covenant with him as an individual. <clears throat> His death on the cross is the bride price paid for you. His death on the cross is the bride price paid for you. That's why there are damages for failure to perform. I don't like the damages part. Well, your ketubah has damages. You know, you get a Jewish wedding, there's the, the bride price there's the, the, the ketubah and the covenants, and you sign the ketubah. If either party fails to, to live up to their part of the ketubah, there are money damages. Yeshua paid with his life. That's why there's damages. Now let's start in John, John 1, verse 36, because we're going to hit the most important part about Passover. I said this is a survey. John 1 and verse 36. When John the Baptist saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. Right? The Lamb of God. Yeshua is the Passover Lamb. In, with Moses and Aaron, they had a Passover Lamb. With all of the great Passover revivals and transformations of the nation, they had lambs for the nation. But here comes Yeshua, and he's... The Lamb of the Father for all time. No more need for animals. He is the Lamb. Now in Matthew 26, he is going to tell you that he is going to celebrate the Passover. And I know every Bible in America says the, la the Last Supper or the Lord's Supper, but that ain't what he said. <clears throat> I don't know. You just don't ever want to have any contradictions with the red letters, amen? You know, the red letters, you want to make sure you're in line with the red letters. Everything else will sort itself out. <clears throat> Matthew 26, verse 18. Go into the city to a certain man and tell him, the teacher says, my appointed time is near. I'm going to celebrate the, what? Passover with my disciples at your house. Okay. So not unlike today, Yeshua has gone to the man that has the meeting hall and booked and paid for the hall. They weren't free then. They're not free now. Landlord wants his money. With that, he also paid for the caterer <clears throat> because Passover comes with a meal. So he's paid the caterer. One place, I think it's marked, that it says that you're to look for a man carrying a water jar. Evidently, Yeshua knows the man's carrying the water jar for whatever the reason is. Maybe the girl that carried the water was sick right then. Or maybe he didn't have one, right? Because he's got to pay for help too, right? Landlord's got to pay for the help. I mean, they, they're not coming to work for free. They don't need to practice. So he gave the sign so that you could find the right guy to know it's where we're keeping the Passover because he's already paid for the hall and he's already paid the caterer for the dinner. Interesting to note, he didn't pay for the first day of unleavened bread because he knew he wasn't going to be here. And he knew because he wasn't going to be here, his disciples were going to be hiding. Right? Because he knew how he was going to be killed. So after they see him crucified, they're running for their lives. I mean, just think about it. If they crucified me, you guys would be in hiding. You'd be in hiding. You might be in a ditch somewhere, three counties over, hiding, man. I don't want to get caught. It's normal. It's just a normal thing. <clears throat> so you're going to keep the Passover. 
So his disciples set it up with where it was. Now, he, he rented a hall. He paid a caterer. What's there to set up? Right? There's a lot of stuff to set up. You got to make sure the elements are in place. You got to make sure the table, everybody knows where to go sit. Because it was more than the 12, it was all of the people who were with him at that time. The 12 just sat at one table. Everybody else was in the room. You had 120 in the upper room. There were people that left after he was crucified. So there were more than 120. So we keep thinking of 12 people and what kind of room do you need. This got to make sure the foot washing is going to go well. That wasn't a normal practice in that century for Jews to do that. They still don't do that. A lot of Christians don't even do that. But he knew he was going to wash the feet. So all the stuff had to be prepared. For the service, just like we do today. It's not all that different. Now, Matthew 26, starting in verse 26, Yeshua is going to make changes to the service. He's going to make changes to the service. Matthew 26, and verse 26, while they were eating, Yeshua took bread. He didn't give thanks. You see all these pious movies, Oh, Father, right, thank thee. No. Barukata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam Hamotzi Lekem Men Aretz. That's what he did, and he broke it and gave to the disciples. And I'm sure people at the other tables did the same thing and ate it. And he said, "Take it and eat. This is my body. This is my body." So now, rather, I mean, we eat lamb for dinner, but the dinner's not the sacrifice. It's the bread that represents his body that's the sacrifice. So he's changing things. Down here in uh, verse 27, he took the cup and gave thanks and offered to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. He made a change. Now, he told them about this change already. Let's go to John chapter 6. And they, they sang a hymn when they left. That's why the after worship is the most important thing. John 6, we're going to take it in verse 53. See, he did this teaching in John 6, and a lot of people left. They didn't want to be a part of his ministry anymore. He's accountable. They didn't understand what he was saying, right? Doesn't it happen a lot in modern time? You say something that people don't understand, say, oh, I'm leaving. All right, look here. He says, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. That is as contrary to the law of Moses as you can get. And he made that statement, and some people had, didn't understand it, but they had the faith to stay with him anyway. And then they got to sit at Passover when he explained to them, this is my body, this is my blood. <clears throat> Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my... They see, he keeps repeating the same thing because it's so contrary to everything they've been taught. But, he's gonna, but he makes it clear on Passover. But he doesn't make it clear here because he's winnowing out those that don't have the faith. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate manna and died, but he who feeds on this bread will live forever. That is a big change. And he explained it in Matthew 26, actually most of the Gospels, when he's giving the bread and the wine, he explains, this bread is my body, this wine is my blood, poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins and so this is an important facet before the Passover meant national salvation now he's talking about your personal salvation induction into the marriage covenant with him and you're going to get eternal life in the bargain that's a pretty good deal that's a pretty good deal let's go back to Luke 22 we're going to look at one more piece of the Passover before we get into our dear brother Paul Luke 22, verse 39. <clears throat> after, after it was done, he went out to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you don't fall into temptation. So he went about a stone's throw away and knelt down and prayed, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat came out like drops of blood falling to the ground. 
the agonia. This is the agony in the garden. And he is having the weight of the world placed on his shoulders. All of the sickness, all of the disease, all of the heartache, all of the trauma, all of the financial trials, all placed on him right then. And he had to be strengthened by the Father to live. Let's go to Hebrews where you can see that. Hebrews chapter 5. The writer of Hebrews makes this real clear. It's an interesting verse. Hebrews 5. Verse 7. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. But he dies on the cross. But see, he would never have made it to the cross if it weren't the intervention in the garden. Because everybody's illnesses placed on him at that time would have killed him. What well, kills all of us, right? We only have one. So he died on the cross. He was saved from the agony. Now, let's go back to Matthew 26. And we're going to look at the betrayal. Betrayal is an important part of the Passover. Matthew 24. <clears throat> I'm sorry, 26 and verse 24. Matthew 26. The Son of Man will go just as is written about him, but woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. So there's a betrayal coming. John records that he dips in the horseradish and hands it to Judas. That's how it went down. But there's a betrayal. It's an important component of the Passover. Now, Brother Paul urges us to take our calling and election seriously with a rigorous examination of ourselves. Romans, a lot of people call Romans, Romans chapter 3, they call Romans the gospel of Paul. But he makes an interesting statement here, our dear brother Paul, <clears throat> that's very important and it's pivotal to the Passover. In Romans 3 and verse 21 he says, Now a righteousness apart a righteousness from God apart from law has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. So they all told that a righteousness from God was going to be imputed to the believer apart from the law. That doesn't mean you don't keep the law. You're not, you're not washed and made clean to go back and wallow in the mud. You're supposed to live right now. This righteousness comes from God. I'm sorry, this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference we all sinned and fell short of the glory of God. And we're justified freely by His grace through the redemption that comes in Christ Jesus. Now, at the time of Jesus, there were only two cups in the Seder. And the cup He took and said, this is my blood, was the cup of redemption. So when we take that cup of redemption at Passover, we are justified freely by the grace. Now, God presented Yeshua as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance he left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. This is an important part of the Passover. We obtain this redemption by following this Passover the way Yeshua gave it to us. None of us keeps the law well enough. I'm scrupulous as I can make it. I still see where I fail. Yeshua can, in Yeshua, we can be right with God. We can be right with Avi. Now I want to go to Colossians chapter 2. We uh, derived a, a very serious and sobering um, practice from this, these two verses, Colossians 2 and verse 13. <clears throat> I don't like to read this in the somebody else. I like to read this in the me. When we were dead in our sins and in the uncircumcision of our sinful nature, God made us alive in Christ. He made us alive. We weren't righteous people doing great things. He found us as sinners, said, hey, you. Knocked on the shoulder. I'm talking to you. Come over here. He forgave us all of our sins. Now it says, having canceled the written code, and every version of the Bible renders it differently. There's handwriting of ordinances, there's the bond of indebtedness, um, but essentially the Greek, the Greek two words, choreographon dogma, mean the bill due for your sin. It's, 
Choreograph on dogma implies that you wrote out in your handwriting, that's why it's ordinances of handwriting, in your own blood, the bond due for your sin. So you wrote it out, whether you did this physically or not, in, in heaven, you wrote it out in your own handwriting, all those terrible things we've done, and the Father owes you death in the lake of fire for that. I'm just going to tell you, Avi doesn't skip his bills. He don't miss one, and he pays them on time. The only way to get rid of that is to nail it to the cross. We're going to talk about what Paul has to say about this in another letter. But this is why we make a sin list. We don't read them out loud. We pray over them for forgiveness, and we burn them in a fire. Then we come in and take Passover. So let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Now, we only go back to the last sin list we wrote. So, as you've been in this a long time, it gets a lot shorter. When you first come in, it's a pretty long list. Paul is talking about the Passover. And he says in verse 17, 1 Corinthians 11, In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, this is the most important thing right there. You've got to keep Passover as a body and you've got to do it as a church. When you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. When you come together, it's not the, should not say Lord's Supper. It should say Passover. You eat. For as you eat, each one of you goes ahead without waiting for someone else. When one remains hungry, another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? I'm not going to do it. For what I received from the Lord, I passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given the Baruka, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant, my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats the bread and drinks the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That's why many among you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we judge ourselves, we would not come under judgment. So Paul as, as a Pharisee's Pharisee is telling you, make the examination of your own life. Confess your sins to the Lord. Nail them to the cross. And you walk away free. Because you're trusting in the blood of Jesus to make the atonement. And this is our practice. And it's what we do every year. Now, I have a picture of our Haggadah. And we were given by one of our patrons at the Jewish temple here in Jackson the outline of the first century Jewish Seder. Now the rabbi procured a Seder circa 100 A.D. Well, when you're in archaeology and you can get within 70 years, that's like saying, hey, this is the Passover Jesus did with his disciples. You want it? Oh, do I want it? But I didn't take any notes. Because what she did when she went through the Seder was put my gospel accounts in order. They're not different accounts. They're just telling you something different that struck out to them when Jesus did the Passover. And so when you put them all together, according to the ancient Jewish Seder, they're in perfect order and make great sense. So that's the Passover Seder we run. And we read all the verses. We have a couple of Hebrew prayers because... We found over the years that those kind of sanctify, or should I say consecrate us to be at this sacred sacred thing. And, uh, and we read all the verses that have to do with the, the things of the Passover that Jesus did with his disciples. And we take it over dinner, and it's been a phenomenal thing since. So this is our survey of the Passover. I want to thank you for watching. 
And uh, I hope you tune in again next time. I think we have the great deacon, Chris Faulkner, up next week. And uh, if you want a free copy of Pursuit Magazine, email me at hungryheartsmin at aol.com. God bless you. We'll see you next time.